Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. The listeners don't get the pre-show banter, but we've been having a couple of laughs, so I'm starting the show in a good mood today. Yeah, that was fun. All right, what do we got lined up for the listeners today? All right, so Old Master Series, the question is, How do you bring your prospect right there when they're reading the words you've written? And maybe you've written those words thousands of miles away from your prospect, right? The answer was revealed 99 years ago. And it's not widely talked about in copywriting until today. In this special episode of the Old Masters series, we look at a book by George Hotchkiss, published in 1924. Um, he had some ideas about using techniques that novelists and hypnotists use, but using them in your copy to bring your offer to life, to get your prospect to see and experience the best of what you have to offer all through the words you choose. And the book is called Advertising Copy, out of print. To the best of my recollection, Superstar copywriter David Deutsch told me about this book many years ago. So thanks, D.D. Now, the author, George Hotchkiss, was both a successful copywriter and a major educator in copywriting. He started out as a newspaper man and then went on to become a copywriter for the George Batten Company, which later became the giant ad agency BBDO. Also, he joined the faculty of New York University in 1908, that was at age 24, and went on to start NYU's Department of Advertising and Marketing. And he stayed with them for decades till the early 1950s. Though the guy really knows how to write copy and how to teach and how to navigate the shark-infested academic waters too, I guess. Okay, so... On this podcast, we talked about something else from the book Advertising Copy in a show three years ago, and that time was Reason Why Copy. But today we're going to talk about something that appeals to a different part of the prospect's brain and is in many ways, I think, much more important. Maybe even more important than this, copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. Most of the time, common sense is all you need. But... If you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. Before we get into six great techniques to amp up your copy, let's look at the power of what we're about to explore. So let's say you accidentally cut your finger with a knife and you're looking for some sympathy. You could say, I injured a part of my hand in an accident, and that's not very powerful. Or you could say, I cut my finger with a knife by mistake. Okay, that might work better, but let's take it to the next level. How about, I was cutting up some onions for some soup I was making. The knife slipped and wouldn't you know it, I cut my index finger. It hurt like hell. Felt like an electric shock came out of nowhere. I howled, and then suddenly blood was spurting all over the place. I had to wash it and put some ointment on it and wrap it up tight with a gauze bandage until the bleeding stopped. There you go. Now you've got a much better shot at getting some sympathy. Why? Because you brought senses and emotions into the description. And along the way, your listener senses and emotions too. Now, that was a gory example. So let's turn to something a little more pleasant. Your sweetheart buys you some fine Swiss chocolates for Valentine's Day. What do you say to your friends to make them jealous? You could say, Dylan bought me some chocolates for Valentine's. Okay, that's nice, but it's a little vague, right? To make your statement more evocative, you might say, Dylan got me some lint dark chocolate truffles for Valentine's. It's better. But how about, I was so happy with what Dylan got me for Valentine's. Lint dark chocolate truffles. They're so smooth and creamy, and I get a jolt of pleasure each time I eat one. 
Again, the description of emotion, happy, and sensory experience, smooth, creamy, makes it all seem so much more real. And sometimes you want to take your prospect right into the experience of your offer. That's what we talked about today. Everything we've just looked at and we'll cover today is based on one important rule. Demonstration is the most powerful form of selling. We're going to talk about how to demonstrate in your copy the specific things that make people more likely to buy. So for this kind of verbal demonstration, Hotchkiss uses three different terms at different points in the chapter that we're taking this from. And these terms are mostly interchangeable, and they are descriptive copy, human interest copy, direct sense description. Best copywriters all use these techniques at key points in their copy. Some of them do it on purpose, knowing how and why they're doing it. But I suspect most of them just do this by instinct because they know these techniques work and they just know this intuitively. One top copywriter, my good friend, John Carlton, is very deliberate and explicit about this. His copy is filled with examples worth studying. And in his teaching, he talks about power words. A lot of them, especially the strong verbs he suggests, are very evocative of specific image, images, feelings, and emotions. So we'll look at what descriptive copy is today, why it matters, when it works, when it doesn't, and how to use it. What really occurs to me before we jump into this week's show is the way that you used this style of writing, both in the pain point, I was cooking soup and sliced my fingers. I, I imagine uh, the girl's waiting for Dylan to come home. She wants dinner to be ready because it's Valentine's. She wants to impress him. And she slices her finger and blood goes everywhere and dinner is ruined. But Dylan, being the understanding guy that he is, comes home with some chocolates and tells her, honey, it's okay. Let's just spend some time together. I actually made reservations at the restaurant, whatever the case may be. But this type of copy where you use emotion, you use uh, senses to bring people into it, it works really well for describing the pain point that your customer might be feeling. And it works really well for describing the desired outcome that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, wow. You concatenated the two examples. I'm, I'm, in, I'm impressed. Um, and um, I, I didn't see that coming. So yeah, yeah, it, it definitely does. And, and that's why, you know, that's, that's why this is so good. I mean, in copy, we're, you know, using pain points and desired outcomes as, as two of our major levers to get people off the dime and into our offer. All right. So let's, let's chunk up a little bit for a second to the big picture. There are two major categories of descriptive copy that Hotchkiss talks about. There's objective and subjective. And we'll get into the specific micro types a little later on, but it's useful now to see the difference between the two categories. So I'll take you back a few episodes to when we talked about the 1964 movie Mary Poppins and the scene where she was singing A Spoonful of Sugar. Remember that? I do. Yes. So it was pretty wild. Beds were making themselves. Jack in the boxes were going berserk. And a robin flies in the window and lands on her finger to sing along. Now, if you were the director of the movie and you were describing the robin part of the scene, you might say the robin flies in the window and lands on Julie's finger. Then it sings along with her in perfect time. Okay. Uh, that's objective. It's observational. It's a description of something you see outside yourself. But I know this is a stretch, Nathan, but let's say you're Julie Andrews and you want to describe the same thing. You would describe it from within your own experience. You might say, it was like I was on ayahuasca, like Aaron Rodgers. I mean, I have never taken the drug myself, but that is how I have heard it described. The feeling of that little robin's claws on my finger and the sweet chirp, chirp, chirp of the robin right along with me as I was singing. Thank heavens he didn't poop on me. Okay, very different description, right? 
That's subjective. And both objective and subjective descriptions are useful. And it's important to know the difference before we get into this further. Let's do a two minute refresher course on why, why descriptive copy is so important. The descriptive copy is we're defining it. The main reason it's important is it stokes the imagination. And more than anywhere else, sales are made in the imagination. Now, to be sure, they are not confirmed in the imagination. It, most people, most sales, they are confirmed in the rational mind. So don't even think that you can use descriptive copy by itself to turn a prospect into a customer. It's one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. But that said, you can take them a good part of the way there with descriptive copy. And as far as the imagination is concerned, the two best ways to stoke it are to stir emotions and to give vivid, realistic descriptions of the way the five senses would perceive some important aspect of your product. Because emotions and sensory descriptions just work so much better than abstract or conceptual characterizations. So much better. Finally, to wrap up our two-minute crash course, a word from the man himself, George Burton Hotchkiss. Many purchases are motivated by the senses and emotions, and so long as human nature remains what it is, much advertising will consist of attempts to stir the senses and emotions. I would only add that half century earlier, this quote from Abraham Lincoln, human nature will not change. And as of 2023, he's still right. No. Oh. Any thoughts about that, especially in terms of the, the copy you're doing? Yeah, I I just remember, I don't remember who told me this or where I first heard it, but I've heard the saying, people don't remember what you tell them, they remember how you make them feel. Yeah. And understanding that when it comes to copy, that a lot of it, you can sit there and describe all the specs and all the details and all the features, but if you don't get people to feel something, what they feel is what they walk away remembering. And so a good piece of sales copy needs to keep that in mind. It's all, it's not all about, but it, a lot of it is about how does this make me feel? Yeah. Ex excellent point. Really good way of putting it. So, all right, let's, let's dig into the nuts and bolts. When you use a sensory emotional descriptive copy, when do you use it? What kind of products should you use it with? So Hotchkiss, list seven types in his book. One, low-priced items. Two, drinks and foods. Three, perfumes and cosmetics. Four, clothing. Five, jewelry and silverware. Six, movies and fiction books. And, you know, 99 years later, I'd add video games to that same idea. Seven, items bought for protection. But beyond that list, I'd Actually, I'm going to add one I hadn't even thought about before, cannabis and, and edibles and CBD oil, but also sporting goods, adventure travel, and even some business conferences, especially I'm thinking of internet marketing conferences, but they're probably if you have network marketing, those kind of conferences where the feeling of community experience is a big part of it. Um, so... You could even, you when you use it judiciously, you could even work this into some info products if the information is exciting enough. For example, get a beverage you like and go into a quiet room. Close the door and turn off the phone. As you start to learn the secrets of, I don't know, descriptive copy, ideas will spark in your mind. You'll get excited. You may have that stunning flash of recognition when you remember how you saw a particular tactic used and it prompted you to pull out the credit, remove the credit card and hit the buy button. You'll get chills of excitement running through your body as you realize you have found a secret you've been seeking for so long. 
Okay, so there are lots of ways you can bring up the image and the experience of a product into your copy this way. There are a few areas where this doesn't work so well, in my opinion. And this isn't Hotchkiss. This is, this is what I've observed and what I would advise a client. Fact-based, serious sales copy where you talk about benefits in but even though you can talk about benefits you should steer clear of sensory descriptions it would raise descriptions it would make something kind of serious look sleazy a serious copy from doctors lawyers and accountants now personal injury lawyers can use gory descriptions of accidents pretty effectively but most lawyers would want to stay on the more serious side and stay away from this some technical b2b sales where the market is cerebral and highly sales resistant you and they tend to communicate in non-sensory terms i mean the bottom line here is you need to know your client your prospect their frame of mind you need to know the context uh i'm thinking of writing sales copy in the form of like white papers or something like that you still need some persuasion you need you need some influence techniques but some of the more traditional direct response copywriting tactics, they'll, they'll kind of stick out. They'll feel like a red flag. And uh, that's one thing that you don't want in any kind of sales copy is you don't want to be triggering spots for your people to step out of it and be like, wait, something doesn't feel right here. So yeah, for certain types of sales copy, for certain types of copywriting, uh, it definitely makes sense to go a little more subtle with these things. Yeah, good good point. I hadn't thought about white papers, but that's an absolutely perfect example. Okay, so let's talk about how to do it. How do you use descriptive copy? Okay, um, these are directly from Hotchkiss. He says two rules. One, never use words to say anything you can say better with a picture or a photo. Now, it needs to be pretty obvious, picture or video, really. I'm, I added video. They didn't have a lot of videos in 1924. But if you think it says it, but the average consumer doesn't think it says it, then you're not saying it. Okay. I mean, but, you know, if you want to show, you know, how tall something is or how smooth it is to the touch, you may, you may want to just... Um, use video or, or photo. And num rule number two, don't overwhelm with adjectives and adverbs. That doesn't work, but use strong verbs. And Professor Hotchkiss advises, the skillful copywriter does not tell us what the thing is, but lets us see it grow before our eyes or puts it in our hands so we can taste and feel and smell it. Once again, there are two types of descriptive copy. Objective copy describes something you can observe. And subjective copy describes something you experience. <clears throat> the first kind of objective copy describes a reaction to the product. Now, reaction, not the action the prospect takes. That's okay, but it's a different kind of copy. That's story copy. And we're talking about the reaction to a product like this. Watching the all-in-one coffee machine was a wonder to behold. I was mesmerized as it ground the coffee, heated and compressed the water before it sent it through the filter and brewed it into a perfect cup of espresso, just like that. So that's something the narrator of the copy observed. And in that way, it's subjective. The object is outside of the narrator. The second type of objective copy is what Hotchkiss calls description of the source. It's not so much about the product as where it comes from. Um, here's an example from the book for Paul's Jans. And this is pretty old fashioned, but you'll get the idea. From the valley of the mountain, the berries, rich, full, ripe, and fragrant with the bouquet that only comes to the berries of the valley of the mountain. Pick from the vines where every cell is filled with sugar and flavors, delivered 
within a few hours to the kitchens in the berry fields, preserved with the exact science that regulates the temperature each minute until every atom of richness and flavor is sealed in a film of pure sugar. And that's the whole story of Paul's jams. Mmm. <laughs> film of sugar. Excuse me while I go get some Paul's jams now. You can see how effective this is. You'd write the copy differently today, of course. But instead of just having an origin story that's factual, mechanical, statistical, and flat, the copywriter dug deep into the sensory world where the berries come from. If you have an interesting story about where your product comes from or how it is made, this might work for you. Third type of our first category, objective descriptive copy, is about results. Think about adventure travel. If you're sending people to Hawaii, and this is done all the time, but just a very easy to grasp example. You can talk about the color of the sand on the beaches and the feel of the ocean breeze against your skin. And if you're writing copy for whitewater rafting, I guess the potential is almost limitless. So Nathan, any thoughts about this objective descriptive copy? Yeah, I'm sure you've read it. Uh, old book, Obvious Atoms, is a great explanation of, in my mind, how this type of copy works. And some of it can feel a little bit dated when you read it. And when you're reading from this book that you're reading right now, the same thing. But just simply describing it in that manner is so powerful. And I think that a lot of times nowadays... I see a lot of copywriters go overboard and try to be too verbose and just cutting back and just uh, describing it in a very simple yet appealing way has, it's so powerful. And uh, I think is a skill that we, it's a skill that I don't see being utilized very often by today's copywriters. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. The other kind, and this is, you know, clearly more novelistic, it's the subjective, not Novelistic, like what a novelist would do. These are subjective copy. This is the other kind. And these are all, re well, reactions and judgments. Physical reaction, emotional reaction, and interpretation. And this is where you talk about how you felt or someone else in your ad felt by getting or using a product. I mean, you can think back to when Dylan brought the uh, chocolates, how the person who received them felt, right? Mm. And, and the physical reaction, of course, is, is sensory, how your skin felt when you first applied the magic cream. Emotional reaction might be a memory. I remember what it was like when I was much younger and my skin was naturally fresh and glowing and this cream brought back that feeling. And interpretation is always subjective. Interpretation could be aesthetic or critical judgment. It could be ranking or rating uh, interpretation. I realized this was the best skin cream I ever used. I mean, this is an area that has so much potential and, you know, so many potholes on this road too. It, you can just go overboard so quickly getting into your inner world of emotions and thoughts and memories. And sometimes that that's going to really derail your copy. But I think when, when you do it really deliberately and sparingly, it can be incredibly effective. Yeah. This one again is one of the ones where I see a lot of copywriters go overboard a little bit. And, uh, I think the lesson of both of these from what I observe is knowing when to use them and knowing how much to use them and knowing when using it too much um, is important. And I don't know, I, I, I guess I want to get your take on how do you know when you're going overboard with these things or when you need to pull it back or when you need to use which one? I think, you know, kind of, um, intuitively and kind of when you get to a point where in the copy where 
you know, your prospect is likely to say, so what? And you can't give yet just another answer to an objection. So you, so what? Because, you know, it looks like this and because you'll feel this way, you know? Um, And I would say also to use a cooking metaphor, don't think of this as a main ingredient. Think of these as spices, but you know, sometimes just the right amount of the right spice can really change a dish from ordinary to exceptional. That's, yeah. that's, that's the idea here. Well, what goes through my mind is I read some of your copy and then I read other people trying to do the same thing and maybe not quite as experienced copywriters and they'll spend four paragraphs trying to get a point across or an emotion across that you are able usually to get across in three sentences. So that that's the thing that keeps going through my mind is where people dump in a whole pound of, of thyme or of oregano rather than just a little sprinkle. Oh, when you said thyme, I thought you meant. <laughs> or, or, or are you, sub- thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, are you saying it's time to wrap up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can almost always use descriptive copy to increase your selling power. Um, the major exception is super serious factual copy. You can use both objective copy, reaction source results, and subjective copy, physical reaction, emotional reaction, interpretation. Remember, people are motivated to purchase by emotions. And descriptive copy is one of the most powerful ways to stir emotions. So this book is out of print and extremely hard to find. I think I saw maybe one for sale on Amazon and we have more than one listener. So it may be gone by the time you look for it. But the other thing I can suggest is be sure to listen to future episodes of Copywriters Podcast for more in the old Masters series. Yes. And if you enjoyed this episode, check out copywriterspodcast.com because we have tons of past episodes of Old Masters series as well. These are always my favorite episodes, David. So I appreciate whenever you put the time (laughs) into creating one of them for us. Another time (laughs) reference. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) All right. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.